Schechter for Senate 2, Gloves Off. Hello, my name is Eric Schechter, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate. I'll be on the ballot in Tennessee, but this message is for people in other states, too. Some of what I have to say may be new to you, about jobs and war crimes and the lesser evil voting strategy and a few other topics. And I'm running a very unconventional campaign. Unlike most politicians, I'm not rich, but I don't want your money, and I might not even ask for your vote. I'll explain that later in this talk. Most politicians are liars, thieves, and murderers. What else can you call people who routinely bomb other countries or fund proxy wars without good reason, destroying the lives of thousands or millions of innocent people? That's common knowledge about politicians of the past. Why do so many people believe that recent politicians might be different? We should give them all a fair trial. And right now the warmonger-in-chief has a peace prize while the whistleblower is in prison. We need to turn that around. The military is where half of your tax dollar goes. A good start on reforms would be to nationalize all the private corporations that make up the military-industrial complex. We'll have fewer wars if they're no longer profitable. Let's put that money into schools, hospitals, food, and other peace efforts. The politicians are insane, too. What else can you call people who want to kill their own children, along with yours and mine? That will be the consequence of their war against nature, if it continues. The commons has been privatized, plundered, and carelessly poisoned, and the ecosystem is dying. Apocalyptic change has begun. Earthquakes, extreme weather, floods, large die-offs of plants and animals, increasing crop failures. And climate change is accelerating because feedback loops cause exponential growth. At this point in the video, I'm inserting a link to my other video on just that subject. Climate change is already killing hundreds of thousands of people per year. If we delay much longer, it will kill most or all of our species. And the price tag for fixing this keeps growing. If you're not in a panic about global warming, then you haven't been paying attention. The deniers and delayers should be tried for ecocide. A good start on reforms would be to nationalize the fossil fuel industries and the other private companies that are killing the planet. We should take the profit out of ecocide and put the money into research on how to save the ecosystem. But right now, the problem foremost in the minds of USers is jobs. And some of the politicians talk about reforms, but the dysfunction is much too deep for reforms. Fixing it will require a totally different economic system. Our current system, even when it's functioning the way it's supposed to, converts progress into poverty. Let me explain. You see, people are inventive. We keep finding more efficient ways to do things. Better equipment, better organization, and so on. That's progress, and so fewer and fewer hours of labor are needed to produce any goods or services. That's one of the few things on which all the economists agree. They call it rising productivity. That ought to be a good thing. It ought to mean more paid vacations for all of us. But instead it means that the owner of the workplace fires some of us, and he and his investors pocket the freed-up salaries and become rich. Then there are more of us underemployed or unemployed, and so there's more poverty. With more of us competing for the few remaining jobs, that puts downward pressure on the wages in those jobs, and so there's still more poverty. And incidentally, the private ownership of our workplaces means that they're not run democratically. That's why so many of our jobs are unpleasant and unsatisfying, and why so many of us hate Mondays. It's not because we're lazy. And it's not just our workplaces that are privately owned. It's also our homes, our banks, our debts, and recently our schools and prisons. Look around you. Just a few people own nearly everything. Why is that? Well, it's because we have a market economy. Let's get past the myths of the market. We've been told that the market is a moral instrument 
that it rewards the industrious and punishes the lazy, but that simply isn't true. Here's the truth. Even if no one cheats, and even if it were possible to really have a free market, the fact remains that market transactions always favor whoever is in the better bargaining position. And so the market rewards those who have much and punishes those who have little, regardless of how much or little they've worked. And consequently, the market increases inequality and creates a small class of very rich people who hardly do any work at all. The welfare slackers on Wall Street are an enormous burden on the rest of us. And money is power, and power corrupts. That's an old saw, but it has been proven by modern sociology experiments. I'd like to put the powerful on trial for stealing most of our economy, but that would be difficult, because they buy the government, twist the rules in their own favor, and make their thefts legal. I'm tired of petitioning the robbers to stop robbing us. And they buy the mass communications media, so you'll seldom hear this stuff. That's why it's so important for this video to go viral. The problem isn't just a few corrupt individuals. It's the system. It's the fact that we've based our lives on the market. Harnessing greed is bargaining with the devil, and that always ends badly. The market doesn't yield a better world. It just yields better advertising. And market prices aren't true costs. They can't reflect externalities such as war, ecocide, and poverty. And the big players are unable to even think about the consequences because the market compels them to compete against each other in offering quick profits to investors. The move to amend people are trying to pass a constitutional amendment to get the money out of politics. I commend them for their good intentions, but they're a bit naive. They're not trying to change anything else about the economic system. My reaction echoes that of Glenn Ford, who said, The idea that the plutocrats can be quarantined from power while remaining plutocrats is absurd. And if we have a constitutional convention right now, it will just make things worse. It will just bring our laws more into line with our very sick culture. We need to heal our culture. We're often told that no other way of life is possible because the greed and apathy we see all around us are inherent in human nature. I don't believe that. I believe they're just part of our current culture. But that culture is doing a good job of perpetuating itself. We'll have to work hard to change it. The way to change it is by seeing it more clearly and reacting to it honestly, questioning and challenging your own habits and those of society around you. Our sick culture isn't just in the ruling class. It's in all of us. It's in the middle class, so-called American dream, which we've all been told is good and noble. You keep your stuff in your house, and I keep my stuff in my house, and we separate our yards with a fence, and we separate our lives with apathy. We think, you're not concerned with my loss, and I don't care about you either. I'm not my brother's keeper. Our possessions separate us. It's difficult for us to imagine how things could be any other way, because ownership has become so deeply ingrained in our culture that it seems like a physical property. For instance, an apple has weight, volume, color, smell, and an owner. But really, ownership and money exist only as relationships between people. At present, they separate people. We must change those relationships to connect people. We must restore the commons. Our separateness is a great sickness, but we rarely see beyond its symptoms, and we're resigned to most of those. Once in a while, some symptom shakes us up. For instance, the mass shootings in the schools. Maybe gun registration would help a little, but that's not the real problem. Some other countries have just as many guns, but a lot less violence. Why are we such a violent country? Why does our government start so many wars? Why are we so full of fear and anger and alienation? And what can we do about it? We don't shoot our friends. Why aren't we all friends? Why do we hate and fear anyone who seems different and bully anyone who seems weaker? Women, blacks, Muslims, gays, 
liberals, recent immigrants, whatever. Honestly, people, before you go hating on someone, why don't you get to know them a little? You'd be surprised. They're not so different as you think. One reason we're not all friends is because our society worships competition and says, your loss is my gain. I disagree. I'm convinced that anything we do with competition, we can do better with cooperation. Alfie Cohn has explained that better than I can, so at this point in my video, I'm inserting a link to his lecture on that subject. I urge you to listen to it. Another reason we aren't all friends is because our material possessions separate us. I already talked about that a little. You're not your brother's keeper, and so your brother gets left behind, and now he's lonely, or mentally ill, or homeless. We ought to take better care of the least among us, as Jesus said in Matthew 25. The state of Utah has set a great example for the rest of us. They're giving free housing to their homeless, because that's cheaper than the alternatives. So you see, there are ways that legislation can help. In this day and age, when everyone can get a gun or a bomb, we can't afford to not be friends with everyone. It's not the homeless who do the shooting, but if you lift up the bottom of society, that lifts up everyone else too. Let's create a caring society which leaves no one behind. War, ecocide, poverty, and alienation ultimately are caused by profits, externalities, and markets. What's the alternative? John Lennon sang, Imagine all the people sharing all the world. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's something we would have to figure out how to do. If it happens, it will be an enormous voluntary cultural change, not a legislative change, not something a U.S. Senator can directly impact. But I felt I should mention it in trying to explain the problems we're facing. I'm not the only one trying to spread that message. There are many others, some working together, some working independently. And this is not just an emotional appeal, but a rational appeal, too. Separateness is killing us all, so we have excellent selfish reasons for becoming unselfish. I want to briefly mention several other issues. When our military bombs other countries that pose no threat, that's the opposite of diplomacy. When our politicians make secret deals to serve their corporate masters rather than we the people, that's the opposite of democracy. When our government can lock people up indefinitely without a trial, that's the opposite of justice. And when we have more prisoners than any other nation, and the prison companies are lobbying for still more prisoners, that's the opposite of liberty. In fact, that's sick. And we need to hear the truth about Fukushima and Monsanto and fracking and all the other poisons that are being dumped into our water and air and food. And we need to stop those poisons. To get the truth, we'll need to take the profit out of lying. Finally, I want to say a few words about my election campaign. I'm a retired college professor. I'm not rich, and I don't have rich friends. I have no experience in business, but that's fine, because I don't agree with the people who believe election campaigns or government should be run like a business, or by a business, or for a business. But when was the last time we elected a poor person, or even a middle-class person, to high political office? Nowadays, winning a seat in the U.S. Senate requires an average of $10 million in advertising. Well, there's no way that ordinary people like you and me can compete on those terms, and I'm not even going to try. I don't want your money. I believe politics should be about communicating ideas, not about collecting bribes. So I'm running a zero-budget campaign. Just to keep things simple, I'm not accepting any campaign donations at all from anyone at all, and I'm not spending my own little savings on my campaign either. I've spent a lot of time making these videos, but the only money I've spent on my campaign is about 20 bucks to register a couple of web addresses. But if I don't advertise, how will anyone hear my message? Getting onto the ballot is easy here in Tennessee, but even after I do that, the corporate news won't mention me. I know that from a previous campaign. And so right now, you're probably thinking, Schechter sounds like he has real integrity 
but it looks like no one is going to hear his message, and so he doesn't have any chance of winning. If I vote for him, wouldn't I be wasting my vote? Shouldn't I vote instead for the lesser of two evils, someone who actually has a chance of winning? Well, I have a new answer to that question. I'm not asking for your vote. Not yet, anyway. Here's what I'm asking. The only way voters will hear my message is if other voters tell them about it. So if you like this video, recommend it to lots of other people. And then, from time to time, check how many people are viewing it. How do you do that? Well, if you're not already on this video's YouTube page, if you're watching this video embedded in some other web page, then at the bottom of the video box, you'll find a link that takes you to the video's own YouTube page. Now, on that page, below the lower right corner of the video box, YouTube lists how many people have viewed the video. If that number starts getting really, really big, if this video goes viral, then I have a chance of winning, and then I'll ask for your vote. And if not, well, at least a few more people will hear my message, and I'll count even that as a success. But you see, for democracy to really work, you'll have to do your part. When I've talked with individuals, they've all said, you've got my vote. But that's not what I want to hear. Apparently they haven't understood me. That's not going to be enough. What I want to hear is, I'll urge everyone I know to watch your video. Please tell me, how can I get that response with my next video? If I do get elected, I'll go to Washington, but a little reluctantly. After all, I'm not eager to work shoulder to shoulder with liars, thieves, murderers, and madmen. But I guess they need some spiritual and psychological healing, and I'll try to bring it to them. And I also promise to continue saying what I believe, no matter how outrageous. But if the press says I've been shot by a lone gunman, don't believe it. But really, what would it take to get a penniless candidate like me elected to the Senate? It would take a grassroots mass movement in which lots and lots of people who aren't politicians actually take an interest in political philosophy, and not just on election day. The real purpose of my campaign is to try to help build that movement. If that happens, the people would become a lot more powerful, and the politicians a lot less powerful, which is fine with me. But with a mass movement like that, we might not even have elections. When the people finally see what is really going on, when we delegitimize the myths that have propped up the politicians, then we may have a revolution. I would prefer that it be peaceful, but our rulers apparently have ruled that out. Our constitution guarantees freedom of speech, but it doesn't say where. And the peaceful Occupy movement was suppressed with brutal force by our so-called security state. That may have been our last chance for peaceful change. And change is coming, one way or another. Perhaps it will come when drinking water becomes very expensive, and people realize that our present economic system is destroying our life support system. Or it may come even sooner, if the plutocrat's abuse of everyone else continues to grow more blatant. For instance, an entire generation, sentenced to lifelong peonage by student debt, may decide that the hand they've been dealt is not just unfair, but unacceptable. Reforms can only bring superficial change. People are starting to realize that our problems are much deeper. We need an entirely different world. Some feel powerless because a few plutocrats own nearly everything. But that ownership is just words on paper, and paper burns very easily. Actually, I hope the revolution doesn't begin quite yet, because we're not ready for it. If we have a revolution right now, it will be a disaster. We're not organized, and we don't yet have enough of a vision of the new world we want. I have some ideas of my own about that. You can read them at leftymathprof.org. But we need a lot more people in that conversation. Join us. The old world is dying, and we can't get to the new one without you. Peace and be well.